We are so thankful that so many of you have joined us for our last installment for this semester of Critical Conversations. My name is Eula Taylor and I'm the proud department chair of African American Studies here at UC Berkeley. Our Critical Conversation series has been organized around two themes. And these two themes have celebrated the life and legacy of Professor Barbara Christian, who was a founding member of our department and a gifted writer, thinker, and teacher. Our second theme explores the concept of abolition democracy, thinking creatively and collaboratively about the practice of abolition as necessary to building life-affirming institutions and robust democratic structures. Through both of these themes, we ask, what are the lessons of the Black feminist, Black radical, and Black intellectual traditions? And for our moment, and what role is Black studies in building more just futures? Before we begin our conversation today, Black feminist geographies of emancipation, I want to turn it over to my colleague, Nikki Jones, who will share a bit more about our Abolition Democracy Initiative. Thank you, Professor Taylor, and thank you to our panelists and moderators today. We are excited for today's conversation and pleased that the Abolition Democracy Initiative could play a role in supporting this event. The Abolition Democracy Initiative, or the ABI as we call it, is a department initiative that works in a synergistic way with the Black Studies Collaboratory to center and respond to the most pressing questions of the moment, questions that are perhaps new to some, but that we understand as enduring questions about Black freedom and the ongoing project of aboli abolition. With support from the Office of the Executive Vice Chancellor and Provost, the Office of the Chancellor and the Dean of Letters and Sciences, the ADI builds on the work of W.B. Du Bois, Angela Davis, and others in an effort to support and amplify the work of scholars, organizers, and activists who are actively imagining and building a world beyond policing and prisons. To this end, ADI, the ADI supports conversations like this one today, conversations that will inspire and invite, inspire, and influence members of our department, the campus community, and our community beyond the boundaries of campus. And I'm so grateful to be ending our series uh, with this panel. When we proposed the ADI about nine months ago now, we knew what this moment would feel like, right? We, because we've been in this moment before. Uh, we know, we, we, we knew that the, we have the start uh, of the trial, the murder trial of Derek Chauvin, uh, the anniversaries of so many tragedies of police killing on top of the over 500,000 lives lost to, to COVID. We knew the potential for grief and loss, right? To overwhelm this moment. And we were very intentional about ensuring that there were spaces for us to exist, to be right outside of that, if only for a moment, an hour, 90 minutes. That is what this, these conversations are about. And I'm so grateful that we have our panel day today to be in that space with us, Professor Shum Summers and, and Professor Shange and, and our moderators. So grateful to have you here today. Uh, so with that, I will turn it over to uh, my brilliant colleague and director of the Black Studies Collaboratory, Professor Lee Rayford. Thank you so much, Professor Jones. Thank you so much to everyone, <clears throat> excuse me, who's joining us today. Thank you to our panelists um, who've made the time um, at the end of very busy, busy semester, um, or I guess at the start of a quarter. Um, my name is Lee Rayford, and I am proud to be the inaugural director of the Black Studies Collaboratory, which is a recipient of the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation's Just Futures grant. And this is a collaborative collaborative initiative to address, address racial inequality through bold and unique humanities-based research projects. The Black Studies Collaboratory asks, what is the role of Black Studies in building a more just future? And how do we solidify our commitment to Black Studies as a public good? Among our goals for the Black Studies Collaboratory is to provide space for critical engagement and collaborative dreaming, to create opportunities for joyful and generative engagement among Black faculty, students, staff, the surrounding community, and around the country. And if you have attended any one of the previous five critical conversations, I think you'll have a sense of the, the work that we're hoping to achieve um, and the community that we're trying to build and we're happy to be building alongside each of you here today. Our work over the next three years in the Black Studies Collaboratory will consist of academic year think tanks, 
summer labs for graduate students, research grants for faculty, students, and a university course open to the public. The Black Futures Retreat, organized in collaboration with a host of community partners, will be the culmination of the initiative. And you can learn more at our department website, um, africam.berkeley.edu. Our conversation today will be moderated by Rila Violet Botts Ward and Tiana S. Pichel. Um, and I'm going to introduce our moderators um, before um, who will take over uh, for the rest of the panel. Rila Violet Botts Ward, Ward is a homegirl, artist, and non traditional community curator from Philadelphia. She is a doctoral candidate in UC Berkeley's African Diaspora Studies Department. And Rees' work centers Black women's healing spaces in Oakland. Her first book, Mourning My Inner Black Girl Child, was published with Nomadic Press in 2021. Um, and for more information um, about Rila Violet Bot Ward, you can um, find her uh, work in her uh, website, which I've dropped in the chat. Tiana S. Pachel is Associate Professor of African American Studies and Sociology here at UC Berkeley. She's the author of the multiple award-winning book, Becoming Black Political Subjects, Movements and Ethno-Racial Rights in Colombia and Brazil. Tiana is the co-principal co investigator on the Black Studies Collaboratory Mellon Grant. I also want to add that Tiana is a dancer, a gardener, a parent, a lover of spreadsheets and of deep belly laughs. And I have had the great good fortune to work with Tiana on this grant as co-conspirator and comrade dreamer. And I can think of no better person to close out our spring 2021 critical conversation series than Dr. Pichel. And with that, I will hand it over to you. Thank you, Lee. I'm going to have to have you um, write my bios for my <laughs> websites because that was beautiful. Um, Good afternoon, everyone, or good evening, um, depending on where you're at. Welcome to this final event um, in the Critical Conversation series. Although we meet today in a virtual space, we do want to begin with an acknowledgement that UC Berkeley sits on the territory of Huchun, the ancestral and unceded land of the Chuchano speaking Ohlone people, the successors of the sovereign Verona band of Alameda County, this land was and continues to be of great importance to the Muwekmu Ohlone tribe and other familiar descendants of the Verona band. We recognize that every member of the Berkeley community has and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since the institution's founding in 1868. As members of the Berkeley community, it is vitally important that we not only recognize the history of the land on which we stand or represent in virtual space, but also that we recognize that the Muwekmu Ohlone people are alive and flourishing members of the Berkeley and broader Bay Area communities today. And we give credit and thanks to UC Berkeley Center for Educational Justice and Community Engagement, as well as the Native American Student Development Office for crafting this acknowledgement. And I wanted to just give a shout out to all the folks who made this possible. So much labor goes into all the things that we do. Um, and as a Black feminist practice, I try as best I can to uh, not further invisibilize that labor. Thank you to Christian Gordon, to Hagi, to Gilberto Rosa Duran, to Rachel Anspach, to Delphine Sims, Jackie Serrano, Maria um, del Rosario, and Sandy Richmond for all of your work in making this happen today. So today we get to talk um, to two amazing um, thinkers and doers. And um, um, I just wanna say a little bit about what we um, hope to focus on in this event today. So we're gonna be talking about blackness and anti-blackness in the context of gentrification and neoliberal multiculturalism. With our guest speakers today, we will explore how blackness gets taken up and appropriated in ways that rarely benefit black people themselves and often displaces them. We will also be talking about how Black folks have navigated their everyday lives through practices of space making and survival, refusal, and resistance. And finally, we're going to discuss how Black feminism offers us much in the way of understanding these complexities and for moving forward towards the goal of abolition. We are so honored to have this fire-filled panel, to have two phenomenal thinkers here with us, both of whom are pushing public conversations about um, anti-Blackness and liberation forward. 
uh, the authors of two beautiful and brilliant books um, that we'll hear more about, um, Savannah Shange and Brandy Summers. Hello all, thank you all so much again for being here. I have the honor of introducing Drs. Brandy T. Summers and Savannah Shange. On a personal note, I just want to say that these scholars have given so much generosity generosity and time to my dissertation work. And I'm truly grateful for that. So thank you for your support and encouragement on my journey. Um, I'll start with Dr. Brandy T. Summers, who is an assistant professor of geography and global metropolitan studies at the University of California, Berkeley. Her research examines the relationship between and function of race, space, urban, urban infrastructure and architecture. She is the author of Black in Place, The Spatial Aesthetics of Race in a Post-Chocolate City, UNC Press 2019. She has published several articles and essays that analyze the relationship between race, power, aesthetics, and urbanization that appear in both academic and popular publications, including the New York Times, Boston Globe, International Journal of Urban and Regional Research, Society and Space, ASAP Journal, Public Books, and The Funambulist. We also have Dr. Savannah Shange, who is an assistant professor of anthropology at UC Santa Cruz and also serves as principal faculty in critical race and ethnic studies. Her research interests include gentrification, multiracial coalition, ethnographic ethics, black femme gender and abolition. She earned a PhD in Africana Studies and Education from the University of Pennsylvania, an MAT from Tufts University, and a BFA from Tisch School of the Arts at NYU. Her first book, Progressive Dystopia, Abolition, Anti-Blackness, and Schooling in San Francisco, Duke 2019, is an ethnography of the afterlife of slavery as lived in the Bay Area. So y'all see, we have some awesome scholars with us today and we are gonna go ahead and dive right in. So I'm wondering if Brandy and Savannah, you all can just talk a little bit about your journey into this series of intellectual inquiries. What was your process of entering into the work that you do both within and beyond academia? And what do you want folks to take away from your labors of love? I'll go first. Uh, thank you, everyone, um, for being here. And I, I just really appreciate being in conversation with my colleagues, um, especially thinking about these incredible questions that are going to come today and to also um, be in conversation with my friend Savannah. So thank you so much for having us. It, it feels good to close out the series this way. It's also intimidating because y'all have had some dynamic speakers and it's been wonderful to watch all of them. So, so thank you again. Um, you know, <laughs> it's funny because when you talk about process, it's often a question that comes up from graduate students, especially as you're getting into the work, you're going into the field and trying to figure out what you're doing. And so for me, sometimes it feels really haphazard. Um, sometimes it feels as though I'm relying on a thought or a feeling or a thing, and I'm essentially trying to investigate it. So, you know, since this series was very much um, organized around the life and work of, of Barbara Christian, I, I think it's important um, for me to situate thinking about my work and specifically as it relates to um, Black feminism. And, and Barbara Christian had said that, um, or she talked about Black feminism being a, a political stance against that which destroys us. And so I think in a lot of ways, imagining the really dangerous work of um, going into a particular history of anti-Blackness, um, but especially how it shows up today, it's emotional and it's very personal. So, so again, as it relates to kind of how I have approached research um, and, and really producing something, it ends up being a really personal process and also very intricate, especially when writing a book, you know, people have told me that, you know, I should establish my audience um, and, and write to them. But to be honest with you, I don't actually know that I've done or am always clear about um, who's gonna read my book 
and then also who I'm writing it for or to. And so for me, writing and, and doing this research is part of a deep cleansing. Um, it's a way for me to figure out what's going on and, and to be clear about what's going on in my head and my heart. So, so sometimes it doesn't always make sense to others. And so it's my job to make it make sense. <laughs> so it's legible to others. So it's kind of like um, Mary J. Blige, share my world. It's like, I'm just kind of like <laughs> inviting folks in. And so that's what I'm trying to do. So, so again, my process is really about noticing a thing. You know, it could be a location, it can be an object. Uh, it can be a process, it can be people, but it always starts with that thing and me trying to figure out various elements that hold it together. And so rarely, you know, and, and I think this and we and Savannah and I can talk about disciplinary and being disciplined by our disciplines. I'm rarely thinking about interpersonal um, dynamics. I'm more of a forest person than I am a tree person. And so that's why in a lot of ways I'm drawn to how to think more um, generously and generatively about qual qualitative methods and take into account the bigger picture. So sometimes the details for me can distort my vision. Um, and again, going back to um, Barbara Christian and thinking about like how she's written about, you know, the work should be rooted in practice and not necessarily be prescriptive. And so I, I, I'm thinking about those ideas again, especially as I'm entering the field. The, the last thing I'll say, and I, and I want to hear from Savannah definitely is, um, you know, I'm, I'm new to geography as a discipline in terms of teaching in it, right? And so there are ways that I've taken up geography in my work, but also have been led by Black feminist geographers who may not necessarily be considered geographers, right? So in the way that I rely on Bell Hooks, I see how she engages space and place to be so incredible and so geographic um, that I put her or at least her work has been um, really foundational for me. And then of course, you know, Catherine McKittrick in terms of thinking about, you know, not only space and, and, and reproduction of space and place, but also the ways that blackness um, is really central to understanding our locations. Um, same thing with Simone Brown. There are these ways that I'm trying to approach the land landscapes and how they come together, but, but and we can talk about this later, but, understanding the space between Black people and Blackness is something that I'm always trying to figure out. So thank you. Yes, okay, and so now Brandy, you have me thinking about everything you were saying. First, I just wanna say thank you to everyone um, for making this space possible. These conversations have been incredible um, and they also emerge out of what is, I think now a 50 year struggle for the ongoingness of Black studies at Cal, right? Um, and I think this wasn't in my bio, but I'm also right now a postdoc in the department, as such as the department is, and I feel very um, incredibly blessed to be, you know, uh, stepping into the shine of all the work that y'all have been doing. Um, and this is not, I'm glad Brandy gave you that answer, because the answer I'm going to give you is not the answer that you're looking for, but I'm going to tell you the real answer, because um, the pandemic has taken away everything except the truth. So I'm gonna be down here with my pen and paper. You know, I entered this path because I needed health insurance. Like I, I'm, I'm materialist from the beginning to the end. And so, you know, my background, like you said, I'm, I, came from, I came out of the theater. Like I started training in the black arts tradition at nine years old as an actor, dancer, you know, shout out to New Freedom Theater. Also, somehow it dropped out of my mind. I must have known you were from Philly, Ree, but I feel like, Billy in the building, you know what I'm saying? Literally, John is on my license plate, but I digress. We won't pronounce it for you. Don't ask us to spell it. I go back. Um, and so I have a conservatory acting degree. Like I did not read a book in college. Y'all were learning about Foucault. I was literally rolling on the floor and pretending to be a lion because I have a degree in experimental theater. Like if you need me to, get, to give you but try like a, like a velociraptor sound, I got you, right? Um, actually writing anything? No, it wasn't what happened. And so when I was graduating, my peers, you know, were standing in line literally all day outside to be in a Crest commercial, right? And then going and serving food for like the second wave of gentrifiers with 225 plus tips. And I had $50,000 in debt that I needed to start paying back at the end of the summer when I graduated. And that wasn't it. So I grew up without health insurance most of the time. That was not cute. It was not something that I was interested in. And I was already teaching theater, right, to young people. Like I started teaching when I was 14 years old, you know, so each one teach one. 
And I was leading kind of new workshops and this and that. But, you know, I would be leading a workshop around like, you know, creative dramatics for young people for two hours on a Saturday and kids would come maybe every couple of weeks when they could because they had to drop off their little sister and this and that. And I would see them at the end of the week and they were holding so much and the little spaces that were cut out for them to release that were so taped on to the ends, were so far apart from the things they actually had to do to make it through the day. I, I was like, okay, well, let me go be a school teacher. I will tell them I'm doing whatever they want me to do and I will do what I came to do in the classroom, right? And so that's how I became an English teacher. Um, and then I did, you know, theater work in my English classes. You know, I taught health. I was an abortion doula. I was everything you do when you are serving young people day in, day out. Um, and then I got cancer in the midst of all that. I had to take off six weeks to get radiation. And they were like, oh, stress is a major issue you need to think about. You need to be reducing stress for this recovery to make sure you know you don't you don't like go into remission. I was like, oh, okay, what's less stressful? Let me go into academia. Again, I told you I was rolling on the floor. If I had been in real classes, I would have known this is a bad idea. Yet, here I am. <laughs> and so, but for real, like the, and so I know you're asking about like, oh, the book project, but the work I do is really the same work. I'm still an educator, everything I know, about how to be a teacher. I learned from the young people of San Francisco, for real, for real. Like I have a, you know, I have a teaching award that I got from UC Santa Cruz that I need to take back to the Mo because that's where I got it from, right? Because everything I know about how it is, what it means to show up um, in my classroom is just to offer respect for all the work that it takes for you to get there in that space, right? Whether you're 14 or whether you're 48 years old, um, I try not to waste people's time. I try to remind them that they came here for a reason. And my job is from the institutional space that I have to remove as many obstacles as I can between them and their purpose, right? And to use my position as an agent of the fucking anti-Black colonial state <laughs> to do it as little harm as possible. And so I say that because I think that's my job, but that's actually not my work. And so I do my job to keep a roof over my Black head, to feed my Black child, and to pay for my little bit of Black joy I can afford on the edges. But my work is actually protecting and defending Black life, starting with my own, like literally trying not to die any sooner from the things like you're saying, uh, Lord help me, I'm saying Barbara, because you're talking about Barbara Christian. Like you're saying, Brandy, channeling Barbara Christian, thinking about what does it mean to actually defend our existence? Um, and so I guess I don't know that I want anybody to take anything away from my labors of love. Don't take nothing away. We got enough taken away. I guess if anything, like, can we leave something? Can we drop something? Can we release our compulsion to be exceptional or to, like, do anything more than the minimum of what it takes to be here? And we know for Black people who are experiencing patriarchy on a day-to-day -day basis, the minimum will <laughs> look like a lot, right? So I'm not saying, you know, the minimum will never be mediocre, but I think sometimes we can, what do you call that in therapy when you transference? We can transfer our dreams of like deep safety and possibility into a grant application, right? And the grant application doesn't deserve those dreams and will never capacitate them, so. I know that's not even what you asked me. That is exactly what, what we asked you. <laughs> so I have a question for both of you. Um, as you, I'm sure, are fully aware, we are having these mainstream, often superficial and fleeting um, conversations about anti-Black violence um, in the wake of the murders of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd, especially, and the uprisings of last year and this year and forever. <laughs> when, um, when I learn more about yet another Black person whose life has been taken, um, for me, sometimes it just underscores the veracity of anti-Blackness everywhere. And so places sometimes can run together. Um, Louisville feels like Oakland. Um, Minneapolis feels like San Francisco in a way. Um, yet in your work, um, there's a lot of specificity of place. And it seems like a very important part of the stories that you tell, right? So Savannah, in your book, you are writing about a city that has and continues to try to erase Black people and Blackness from it, even as it uses it, uh, Black people and Blackness. And despite a long and complex history of Black San Francisco, you ask in the opening pages of your book, 
who is disposable in a progressive dystopia, the real life city of mirrors where diversity is king, settlers keep settling, and slavery never stopped, unquote. For you, Brandy, your work is in the most quintessentially Black U.S. city, right? Or, you know, I'm sure some people uh, in other cities might debate it, but I, I think of it as the most quintessentially Black U.S. city. And you show how Blackness gets trafficked and represented through what you call aesthetic emplacement. So I want to know, how does place matter for the stories you tell? How should we be thinking about Blackness, anti-Blackness, abolition, and, and, and in place? Okay, you went first last time, Brandon. I can try to answer this. And um, I'm completely food motivated. I'm like a 145 pound, 40 year old rat who wants to always be eating. And so you're going to get this vegan croissant that I just put out the oven because I froze it in advance. Stop bragging. Stop bragging. I'm sorry. Did you want some of the single origin soy cappuccino that's actually, <laughs> yes. you know, from a farm in Ethiopia where at least they say these people getting something in in like a living wage um because what they call a living is never a living for us but anyway so i'm glad you asked this question um because you talked about minneapolis you talked about frisco but it also brings to mind another set of conversations that you pulled together at cal thinking about anti-black state violence state violence in brazil right and so which by the way if you were not at that gathering it was anyway that was an incredible space and i think it really gives us context for this question because it's a hemispheric scale in terms of the lived afterlife of slavery, but it's also a block to block skill, right? So Black Life in the Mo, also known as Fillmore, um, where everybody's favorite round the way mayor, right? Just greenlit the demolition of housing projects in Western Edition that are not even 20 years old. Like if these projects went to Cal, they wouldn't even had to declare a major yet. You know what I'm saying? But yet they're already being torn down A because of not benign neglect, right, because of uh, metastatic neglect, right, but also because of the fatality of representation, right, and so but folks who are living through what that means right now in Western Edition and, and the mode, that's not the same as what it means to be Black even in Hunter's Point, right, less than two miles away, um, and so to me, place matters, like, in a general, like, place, like, capital P place, because it shapes everything it shapes the literal terrain on which we make freedom. So when I was writing the book, I was actually living in New Orleans for most of that time and doing like different kinds of organizing work. I was in BYP 100, I was in the Wild Sea Collaborative and in these different kinds of uh, structures. When I tell you the pace and pattern of doing work in New Orleans, <laughs> it's completely different. Like, yes, these are black people. Not only is the way that blackness is made different, right? You got a seventh word creole, you got, you know, a whole different, literal meanings of what blackness shows up as but also you're going to be sitting for 90 minutes checking in on how people are doing hearing about cousins that you will never meet three swamps away before you even get to an agenda also an agenda ooh, why do we need that honey right and so maybe you know saying tiana so maybe you know something about this right and this is also a room in which everybody in that room knows how to work a gun most of them own one but somebody gonna come in and say, oh, y'all aren't serious. This isn't activism, right? Someone who, for whom violence has been six times displaced because of the particular kinds of buffers that their black body gets in certain spaces, you know? And so I think for me, the place piece is really crucial in understanding the how, right? The literal how of day-to-day, -day, how, how, how the work gets done. And I guess I'll also say, thinking about place like, you know, I moved around a lot growing up, but I claim, you know, I went to middle school in Philly, went to three out of four high school, three out of four years of high school in Philly, graduate, you know what I'm saying? Like, so that's like a place that makes sense to me. But when I got to California, it was so clear to me that not only, obviously I'm a guest here and shout out to, um, I feel very, shout out to Brandy. Thank you for having me in your city, I'm living right now in the city of Oakland, California. Um, but the entire ratioscape was different, right? N you know, I came up thinking, you know, in Cali where we riot, not rally, like I had this, which is true, which is true, but I had this kind of like set of representations of California Blackness that gets, gets kind of repurposed and, and, and refracted. But now I get here and I realize like, oh, 
Y'all are so loud because you have to shout so loud. You have to be so much to be heard, to be present, to claim a space that is so um, expertly anti-Black, right? And I also feel like, I guess the last piece I'll say about this is we don't always think about Blackness in its contexts, right? And so race means something. So if you go to the East Coast, people are really trying to argue you down that Latina diet is not a race. They really try to go in and be like, what do you mean? And if y'all are here in this chat, you can go ahead, give me your points right now in the chat about how Latinos are really, they can be any race. It's not a race. It's black and white and boobity bobbity bee. And when you might be in Puerto Rico, right, when you might be in Salvador, it's real clear. That Latino dot doesn't have purchase there because it's blackness and whiteness. And in this context, in this physical place, brownness is a specific kind of racialized, um, of racialized magnetizing of assault, danger, fatality, right? That I feel like this, and that's also true about certain modes of Asianness, right? It's not true about other modes of Asianness or perceived, right? Whenever I'm thinking of modes, I'm thinking of as when the police when the emergency room doctor, when the judge sees you, right? And so I feel like it's important for us to also think about Blackness, not as a type, <laughs> not as one, not as like one of an example of races, but that, that these ratioscapes shape how Blackness as a specific, unanalyzable, and, 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 and something you can't make an analogy with, right? It is an exceptional state to the state, but it's also working with all these other also exceptional states to the state, you know? Um, so I guess I just to put that out there in terms of California Blackness, Blackness in California is not moving in the same literal terrain as it is in Iowa, as it is in Minneapolis, Louisiana, Brazil, and I'm sure state to state in Brazil is not the same, you know? Thank you. So every time I'm on a panel with Savannah, I have to throw away notes, like, because it always ends up being different. So now this is what we're doing. Okay, so, you know, that question, I hope my mom isn't on here, but that question's really important because I think because I'm from Oakland and because Oakland is one of California's few Black cities, and it's, I mean, despite whatever demographics, it is still a black city. Um, you know, race and place has been in my mind as, you know, significant to the political, economic and cultural organization of the city and of cities, right? And so coming from Oakland, I know what it's like to have a feeling of loss, um, to know that you've lost your place. And especially coming back here, I, I feel that all the time why I don't want my mom on here is because I, um, so yesterday was Easter Sunday. And though we don't really fully um, celebrate Easter, I went to lunch with my mom and my aunt. And it's great because we get, I get stories. My aunt is the storyteller. She remembers everything. And so there were times, my family's from Louisiana and they migrated um, to San Francisco and lived in Hunter's Point and then moved out to Lakeview. Um, they were blockbusters and then they moved to Oakland and that's where I was born and raised. And so I learned a lot of different stories about things I didn't know, funny, funny, you know, talk and laugh and whatever. But the one thing I did know and I've always known but didn't necessarily know the details is how much pain is in my family and how much we understood it as being based on interpersonal relations. This person having an outside family, this person having, you know, having to work at shipyards. And so they had to leave their family back in Clark's or Monroe or, you know, New Orleans because they couldn't, you know, bring their family, right? These seem to be individual reasons why there was some kind of rupture or some kind of pain. But as I'm listening to my aunt tell stories, I was realizing how much of our stories map upon literally like the land, understand how our family really relates to all these different migrations, multiple migrations of black people from Louisiana to California. But still the same thing was that we are all in so much pain. And I think in a lot of ways, I mean, literally all of us, all of us. And part of it was, as I was talking to my mom about it later, was understanding the ways that we have learned to survive in this place by needing to attach to a place, right? And so 
understanding place, of course, as it relates to the, the chocolate city and the loss of the chocolate city. And why it was important for me to not say that DC was a mocha or cappuccino or, or whatever, and instead still bring its chocolate back. To say that it was post-chocolate, but to know there was still chocolate there. I don't actually want to release DC from Black like I don't want to divorce the two it's still there and so I think it's really important for us to or at least it's important for me as I'm moving back to try to write about Oakland to not only think about that pain and I don't think about this in the sense of necessary I when I was in grad school I wrote about like psychic wounds and I was trying to understand all this stuff and I was an Afro pessimist for a second but I was really trying to <laughs> under a second trying to understand how the pain still can be generative, but then what geography does is it locates us. And then again, recognizing the ways that my transition from, I mean, that was the thing, that's actually what got me crying yesterday is my, my aunt talking about how they didn't know what Jim Crow was because they grew up in San Francisco until they were sent to Monroe in high school for a year. She she. My, one of my aunts had bottles thrown at her. There were white men driving in convertibles with um, rifles going to scare people, right? And so the way that they felt helpless but still survived and again, literally knew nothing about Jim Crow until they landed in the middle of it. To understand the forms of survival that we don't talk about but still figure out and it comes through in our work in different ways. So what that's meant for me, just in terms of writing, is that I've had to create a space between me and the work, but still knowing that I could sprinkle a bit in it. And I think that's my challenge in terms of writing about Oakland is because that space becomes that much smaller and I'm struggling right now. Like I'm struggling. For those of you who know me IRL in real life, it's like I can put up a clear, you know, I can be very professional and all together, but it's like one of those things where I have to make choices in terms of what information I present and how still at this point, how much place still matters so much to me. That's why I had to be here. That's why I have to live here in order to do the work. And it's still something that I'll continue. That's what I talk to my graduate students about. There's this texture that you pick up once you're here. And so I think a lot of what Savannah was saying, doing that work from New Orleans, to you know, working in San Francisco, it's a different thing. And we got roots there now. So we are absolutely connected to New Orleans and to all these other areas in North. I mean, I'm more from Northern Louisiana than Southern, but still these ways that we're connected and the circulation of blackness still has its stain. And so that's again, where place matters so much, not only to me, but I think, you know, as well to Savannah. So these are great questions, but thank you. <laughs> Ooh, and y'all are providing such rich answers. Thank y'all for the realness and authenticity with which you're approaching this conversation. Um, I wanted to ask y'all about Black geographies of memory, and y'all have already started to touch on this, but both of your works discuss the seen and unseen of Black geographies, and y'all make us consider the relationship between Blackness, temporality, the past, present, future lives of Black folks more broadly. You invite us us to think about how geographies of memory map themselves onto Black life and urban life, both materially and metaphorically. Brandy, I'm wondering if you can talk about how Black aesthetic and placement demonstrates a process of anti-Black nostalgia that erases the chocolate city yet reproduces its aesthetic for capital gain. And Savannah, I'm wondering if you can talk about how Black geographies of memory allow urban spaces to stay alive in us, which some might argue is metaphorically, right? And some might argue not. Um, but even when they no longer exist materially, for example, when you talk about in your article, Black Girl Ordinary, the towers, right? And other demolished project homes, how they become, as you say, an excuse to get ink, an excuse to get tatted up, up, an excuse to fight, right, to rep or claim a space or a place that's no longer physically there. I'll go ahead. Um, you know, I think mm, when I got, the book is only a partial portion of my dissertation. And so I expanded it once I started writing the book, when I knew I had to write a book. 
And so I think even in coming to the work altogether, I was thinking about how to account for what was no longer there, um, or at least what could no longer be seen. Um, and so that's where traces and, and thinking about what lingers um, still matters to me. Um, and that, again, thinking about pain and loss comes through somehow, but still it's like, there's still there's still something there, right? And so for a while, I had this resistance to naming or naming the thing. Um, Black aesthetic and placement didn't have a name for the longest time. Um, at the same time, I knew that you needed to name something in order for people to pick it up. Um, yeah, so, so generally, and I keep going back to Barbara Christian, um, but like, to produce theory, right, like the noun, um, is different than theorizing. And, and, and she's talked about that. And so I think that in a way, producing a theory makes people want to use it and compare it and all this other stuff. Like I said earlier, like in my work, I was really trying to document the distance between Blackness and Black people. And to me, honestly, it gives us this vision into the future, honestly. So just think about this relationship. And so that's why I think, you know, I, what I've written about, for example, um, my questions about a lot of the Black Lives Matter imagery um, and the art that's popped up around different cities, um, around the country and also around the world, that I, I, I'm not buying a lot of it. Um, and I have issues with a lot of it, but I think part of it also goes back to what Savannah was saying earlier. Like I came to Black aesthetic and placement through my questions about our obsession with representation. You know, we will say, you know, representation matters. We'll talk about it every year, every awards season. We talked about it most recently with Kamala Harris's nomination. We talk about it every season of Fashion Week. We're going to count the number of fashion models. Like, we count the number of award winners. We're happy when a Black person wins a SAG award for some reason, right? So we're enamored with firsts. Um, and so it makes it easier for a capital to wrap its strong arms around these different representations of blackness. And so for me in order, you know, it, what it seems as though is that it's in order, to, capital makes it so that inclusion and diversity end up being the goal. And that is solvable, right? Because all you gotta do is add some extra color um, to the mix and then we should be happy, but that's not essentially what it is, right? And so, of course, what I was finding also in, in thinking about memory, thinking really about your question, you know, it, it's not one of those things that's necessarily just limited to white people, though it's certainly a practice that's perpetuated through white power structures. But as I'm thinking about DC, I was finding how often it happened amongst black people and especially black middle class people or aspiring black middle class members, they were doing the same thing. So there's this way again that my focus on trace, my focus on what lingered, what was left still had me not necessarily, I didn't get to the part where I got to focus on what black people were doing or what black people were making. It was that other stuff before I had to get through the mess first and I had to figure out why it was that so many politicians, so many black business leaders, all these folks were like proclaiming their commitment to black people when they literally were producing these structures, institutions, organizations that were killing black folks. It didn't make it literally didn't make sense to me. So with the trace, I know something's there. And so my hope is that like with my next project, I'll get to focus on what black folks are doing because I couldn't do it because I had to break down so much in DC. So that's what that's what Bay, Black Aesthetic Complacement, was all about, was me trying to understand the ways that the grip of capital, the sub, how seductive capitalism has been, that what's happening at least as it relates to blackness and, and, and essentially black people. Yeah, I mean, that's such a trip. So two things. One, you know that saying that usually, I feel like is usually directed towards um, poor people in various ways. The ways we've survived aren't always pretty, right? And something I come back to often, you think about it in terms of people thinking about, you know, demonizing certain kinds of survival behaviors, but it's also bringing this to place. Kermit said the black misleadership class. I feel like that's also a reminder of the ways we survived haven't always been pretty, right? And then some of these people are surviving in ways that are murderous, right? Um, and has to, and then we have to think about what are the horizons of blackness um, and black liberation, liberation for all black people when some black people are still on that KRS-One 
officer overseer structure. Um, I also want to just point to the chat, and I feel like folks are really bringing up really concrete examples of what we're talking about, like Diana bringing up what's going on in um, Colombia and the uh, embodied fatal confrontations with the state people are dealing with. So, Re, you brought up the towers. So, I'm so glad you brought up Tower Side because in that article, I talk about it as an excuse to get ink, but really, um, when I talk about the towers in the book, I footnote it because anyway, the stuff I'm trying to do with footnotes that we can <laughs> we can footnote that. But um, one of my students who still claim Tower Side, so Tower Side is the the Geneva Towers in Visitation Valley, right next to Sunnydale. So Sunnydale, if this means nothing to you, just let it flow around, right? So Sunnydale is the largest housing project in San Francisco has 800 some odd units next to, to tower, next to like contiguous basically with Sunnydale was the Geneva Towers. Geneva Towers were up for maybe 30 years, demolished in 1998. So I bring it up because the last student I knew who claimed tower side in that way was born uh, in 97, right? So the towers came down before this boy had a full, had, you know, a full mouth of teeth. And yet he was shot dead in the street in 2014 at Silver and San Bruno, claiming tower size. So that's not an excuse in the way that, like, it's an excuse, like, you just want to fight, right? It's a way of using nostalgia, because nostalgia is all you have in a place that is constantly pushing Blackness into the past, right? In such a way that, so... So two, two, two reasons about this. So for instance, the student who I call Keenan, um, in a school where it's like, oh, okay, we're supportive. And this is, you know, very social justice school, like all the things that you want, your chill, they got it all. They teach in Phenom, they got Audre Lorde in the curriculum, it's trans, you know, a trans homecoming king, like we're doing everything, everything, all the representation is there. And like a lot of organ is happening. Whatever you want is happening. Right. So there's, you know, you could wear a do-rag to school, you could wear a hat. You know, da, 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 da. So the, the 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 dress code seems to be culturally, you know, accessible. Except when Keenan comes to school, right, with as many of us who have lived in and in proximity to, even if not in precarity, because most people who live in that precarity are not gonna get on this goddamn Zoom for the same reason that they're in that precarity, right? But for those of us who live in relation you know about the ways in which um, the Black aesthetic of, of remembrance, right? Whether it's airbrush t-shirts, um, you know, having your whole car, you know, with all kinds of RIP stuff, or like often in San Francisco, there'd be like lanyards where people would wear, you know, kind of a lanyard with like a picture, like a big picture of, you know, RIP this person, their photograph, maybe photograph of them together, right? So Keenan wearing, uh, the first time he was suspended, at Robeson was for wearing um, a lanyard of someone who had been killed in his neighborhood and they told him to take it off. He said, I'm not taking it off. <laughs> like my cousin died over the weekend when we take this off and this is the confrontation that we're having, right? And so that becomes, oh, it's, oh, but now it's gang. Oh, it's this and that. And my, this is San Francisco. You're serving young people in San Francisco on the, in the, everything gang, baby, everybody's affiliated. Of course, listen, it's not about, oh, this is, he's being criminalized. No, baby, he's in, He's living a life that is in the black market. This is not about somebody being mistaken for, but an actual disrespect of the, the right to remember, right? And so I don't, Laura, see, I told you about this. So now I, it was not my intention to go to church. It was not my intention. But the Christian, yo, the Christians be doing it all the time if you hop on these other Zooms. And so I'm gonna just, just, if this ain't you, la, 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 la. So I'm Buddhist. So I'm just got, this is what is coming to me, right? So I'm Buddhist. Bracket that all you want. Shout out to all the Asian American communities who have fucking held on to and kept something of this sacred practice so that we could share it, right? So the historical Buddha, the story goes, oh boy sitting there trying to get to liberation or whatever, and all these demons are coming. You know, he's sitting there on his little Bodhi seat, you know, right on the cusp of enlightenment. And the last demon that comes is doubt or Mara. So there's this historical story of the Buddha sitting there and Mara comes and is like, who, essentially, who the fuck are you? Like, who do you think you are to be free? Right? This is 3,000 years ago. Who do you think you are to be free? And this is almost where supposedly he almost went back to his life as a prince and like went back to all that. 
but instead he calls on the earth. So the story goes, he places one finger on the earth and calls on the earth to witness who he is and to witness that he has the right to be free, that that is his birthright to witness where he is and who he is. And to me, to claim tower side, to get that on your, to, to stand in a gas station in Silver and Bruno and say, who the fuck are you talking to? Is to claim that you have the right to be here. And if all you have to claim has literally been demolished, London Breed, your girl is literally demolishing what families have to stand on. I think it's important that we don't see these aspirations to matter at any cost as somehow mistakes or losses or something other than I get to choose how and what and for why I come into this peril, you know? And so just anyway, that's what you start speaking on towers I had you thinking about. Thank you. Oh man. Yeah, you definitely went to church. <laughs> um, I'm just, I'm just saying. Sorry, um, on, on, a, on, on a whole Monday, <laughs> um, um, I'm so thankful to have you guys here. Um, so I'm going to ask a question that actually comes from our beloved and brilliant colleague Nikki Jones. So uh, she says the following, uh, a recent talk by Joy James, the architects of abolitionism, had me thinking about the discourse and uses of abolition over the last year. I'm thinking about the distinctions between abolition as a political project that requires a confrontation with state violence and abolition as an aspirational idea that lacks a blueprint in James's words. And that could be commodified and co-opted as political or intellectual performance. So how do you both think about these distinctions and the potential for transformation within and, ac and across each? Savannah's taking this one first. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so two things. I forgot this whole other thing I was going to say to the last question, but it feels important. So I apologize. I've been writing all in the margins and it's the same, it ain't saying right. And so... The last thing I want to say about memory and nostalgia and place in San Francisco, and I feel like I need to say it now, is that this is kind of in terms of Blackness without Black people, I feel like you were thinking about that in terms of its commodification and it's creating into capital, right? Part of what happens in San Francisco, hot take alert, controversial alert, is that Blackness expands in ways that are fatal and fatalizing, right? There are communities in which, like you go to the TL, Cambo like I had Cambodian students from the TL who were coming up through the same, the same um, militarized transnational street violence, right? Such that you can think of a Black Pacific, right? The Black Atlantic gives a certain kind of life and death. The Black Pacific gives a different set of lives and deaths. And it may not be, obviously you don't walk into being Black, right? Black is a, a specific thing. And I think some of the kinds of disposability that we think of as so paradigmatically Black in Louisville, right, in Sanford, right, there are differently racialized genres of disposability at work in the city of San Francisco. And if we don't speak on them, we actually miss the work that's happening because some of the most powerful abolitionist work is happening between differently racialized street organizations. They tried to put the gang injunction in in San Francisco. It wasn't just blacks rising up against an anti-black gang injunction because half the blacks were trying to just get, sell their little house and get out of San Francisco. It was only people who were actually on Big Block, who people were actually named on the gang injunction alongside Samoan street involved people who were named on the injunction, alongside Chinese gang like folks, alongside not just Latinx, but alongside Sureño and Norteño folks who actually put aside generations of like real conflict to be like, you know what? We're actually going to mobilize together to keep us to keep us having the right to be in our city and on our streets. And so that's a kind of like unified, fuck the police, abolitionist move that is not about Blackness in a embodied way, right? But is about mobilizing against anti-Blackness as is instantiated by the state. And that kind of nostalgia is so embedded in what it means to grow up, black, to grow up broke in the city of San Francisco. So the first student that I lost, that I had taught, 
with Javon Wagner King in 2007, shot by somebody using a bus as a drive-by weapon, right? Javon's funeral in 2007, his homie G1 makes a song about him that he loves so much, right? G1, an incredible poet, MC. Three years later, we're playing the song that G1 made about Javon at G1's funeral. At G1's funeral, so G1, Mexican both sides representing the mission. You know what I'm saying? Nothing black about G1, right? And he's also an MC, a rapper, someone who's you know, committed to his community. At G1's funeral, a Filipino kid, Tino, graph artist, poet, spoken word artist, right? Ran, runner up to G1 when G1 won the citywide slam championship, right? Tino writes a piece for G1 when G1 passes in 2012, right? G1 died alone in the street three weeks ago at fourth admission across from the Metreon. And now at Tino's memorial, we playing the song that he made for G1. So from Black to Mexican to Filipino, Frisco kids are living in a kind of precarity that is not accounted for in some of the really cute ways we wanna talk about what it means to be disposable which is not to say that blackness is not a specific thing, but if you don't know what it means to lose and lose and lose and lose again, you might need to take a step back and listen to somebody who does, right? And so, who is not me? I'm just trying to step take that step back. So anyway, all that to say, woo! Um, and that's what Joy James was telling us. So if you have not listened to this talk, we're going to go ahead and link it. Is it linked yet? Is it linked yet? Because I'm talking about you better get that glue together because the edges, matter of fact, just, just, take, just take the do-rag off, okay? Because the edge is going to be snatched. Joy James has not laid down an edge in 25 years. She don't give a fuck, okay? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Recording. I'm so sorry. Eula, you're here. Oh, my God. Eula's here. I'm sorry. I really apologize. Joy James, a paradigmatic example of a scholar who has disinvested from certain aesthetic performances of respectability, um, including her own importance, right? And so I think what Joy James is telling us is in part, she asked this question, and I'm gonna quote her. She said, everybody abolitionist, everybody radical. She said, what is the definitional norm of radical struggle? A study group? close quote. She said, baby, I'm talking about people who have been to war, right? And some of those people, Diana talking about in Colombia, some of those people in war right now. And so I think part of it for me is not being confused with what, the way we make our, you know, our job and our work. Like if the university is going to pay you to do it, I mean, it might be worth doing, right? But it's not going to get you free. So I think that's one of the things she says in that talk that's really useful is that as soon as you are doing something that's effective, they will shut you the fuck down, right? And if you're doing something that's not effective, she says they'll give you a very long leash, right? Which isn't to say that the ways that we create space for life are not worth doing, right? And that does not make them part of the project of demolishing the state. So to me, there's the abolition, you know, Ruthie Gilmore talks about abolition is about growing things. Mariam Kaba talks about, you know, it's a presence, it's not an absence, right? I'm into the absence. So there's a destroying and a rebuilding. And so I think we need to keep them both in hand. And there's a lot more space to do rebuilding and growing and boobity beepity, a poppity poppity ba, which we can think of as like making the world, which we need to do, we need to make the world that's going to exist after the walls come down, right? We need to have a way, we need to know how to be together and we have to survive to that moment. And the way, um, sometimes the work that needs to be done to, to destroy what is constraining black life is not going to be funded, right? You might be funded and you might be doing it, but if you telling them what you do with it, they're like, okay, cool. Then you might need me to be doing something else that may not be included in that document, right? And all of us know this from every kind of work you've ever done. Like, when have you been on the clock? You're supposed to be folding clothes, but you're actually you're sitting over here building about, oh, but did you read that book by Fanon though, right? So there's ways in which we steal and snatch back and create spaces that are against the institution that we are in. So this is not about like feeling like big and bad or whatever. Just play your position, like be in your lane. That's the other thing to take from that talk. Like everybody don't need to be in the streets. 
with an AK because A, you don't know what to do with it and B, you're scary. Don't be worried about being scary. Do what you can do now to protect the lives of the people who are not scary. Brandy. <laughs> All right, y'all. <laughs> Savannah, and see, the thing is, in answering this question, I'm like, I clearly was going to start with you. I mean, I, and, and get to that Joy Jane, that, that, everyone should watch that Joy James lecture. I think it's like an hour or something. Just watch it. Um, I don't know if it's linked. I haven't been looking at the um, comments, but okay. So I think that, where can I start, Savannah? <laughs> So, okay, how about this? What else? So, okay, I taught a Black Geographies class in the fall, um, seminar in the fall, and Savannah's book was actually one of the first books that we read, and we read it alongside Black Marxism, or at least um, snippets of Black Marxism. And so from the, from the class, you know, what I really underscored for the students was Savannah's distinction between revolution and abolition. And what it did was it had me, and specifically, this is a class about Black geographies. It, it led me to ask my students how we might consider Black geographies as being unmoored from the discipline of geography and instead freeing it so it can linger and, and lead basically multiple disciplines and, and their engagement with space, right? And so as it relates to the work that's being done in the academy, I mean, honestly, what Joy, Joy James was saying is that we really aren't doing shit. Like, and not to say that the work isn't work, it just means that we aren't getting us free, right? That, that's just not happening. And so we can recognize that and act accordingly, but it's really important to know it. And so the other thing I wanna point out that she also said that was at least really important for how I, at least a little bit of what um, Savannah's talked about, but what I had mentioned earlier is that she talks about assimilation and she talks about through our process of assimilation, we've basically taken on, taken on the traits of a particular class, right? So the black middle class thinks it's the bourgeoisie when in reality, they're the petite, petite bourgeoisie, right? Because they don't actually own anything really. Like collectively, we don't have the kind of wealth that we need. But if we think about how we perform in structure, like it, we act as if we're invested in capital and that's the issue. So it creates this clear split really between the black petit bourgeoisie, right? And the working class and the poor. But what's important in that designation in the split is that what's masked is when we this we claim this universal blackness. The assumption is that we are all the same because we're all black. We all have the same experiences, but instead, experientially, we live with the same, we excuse me, we don't live with the same vulnerability. And that's what Savannah was talking about with those the tragic deaths of these students, that we don't live with the same vulnerability to police and poverty. And so as we're thinking about abolition, as we're thinking about abolition in contrast to revolution, I, I also want to second, you know, what Savannah was saying about um, Mar what Mariam Kaba has discussed in terms of abolition being this framework that incorporates building a future and not just destroying it. And I think that's something that doesn't get taken up often enough at all. It's about imagining different possibilities. And so though, you know, I've talked about pain and, and ways that, you know, various wounds kind of honestly like drive and lead our lives, there still needs to be this way to imagine a possibility. But the issue ends up being that capitalism appears to constrain our ability to imagine. And that's what ends up happening that we don't really know that we can imagine something different. And instead we're just kind of continuing along the same same train, right? And so the understanding is that within the institution that we're stuck, that we only have a certain number of limits. We, li we are presumed to solve the problems that everyone else created. We're supposed to fix the shit that goes against Black folks. We're supposed to fix what's happened under segregation, continuing segregation. We're supposed to fix what's happened as we've lived in public housing. We're supposed to fix all those problems. If not fix it, at least tell other people who created the problem to do it. So abolition, or at least imagining abolition allows us to say, hey, I actually don't wanna do that work. I wanna go and draw some butterflies. 
And I don't have to talk about ways that I got to fix this system and these problems that have existed that are literally on my body, in my DNA that I am carrying with me. I want to draw butterflies with my daughter because that's what she wants to do. And that's what I want to do. But we literally don't have the space or imagination to do that. So thinking about not only Joy James, thinking about what's been going on, I just want to draw, I want to paint. Like, I don't want to have to do this anymore. I'm tired. I'm tired. And so to recognize where there are these distinctions, I think allows me to at least make that space and for me to share those kinds of ideas with other people. I will not be in those streets with an AK. I will not be the ones like trying to beat people down. I literally like once I gave birth, everything changed. Like once I had that baby, everything changed. I have to live so I can raise my baby. So everything I do at this point is about how to survive, how to survive for her, but then also still try to imagine a future that I want her to live in, even if I can't live in it myself. And so that's where the imagination part comes to abolition. And that's where we end up having to be desperate for it. We have to do it so we can freaking paint and, and draw and skip and do all kinds of other things. So anyway, I love that question, Nikki. So I'm, I'm glad you brought that. It is the question. And I feel like I'm tapped I, I'm sorry y'all for double dipping, but what you just said is so deep, Brandy, about the wanting, like the wanting to um, protect our, just wanting to have, like allow our children to be children, right? And having that. And so part of what James talks about, yes, in that talk was, is, is the captain maternal, but I think about with, with James's work on the maternal and she's thinking of the maternal as an ungendered, right? Not the maternal as in a feminine, but as a maternal, as in that impulse to care. And, but she also thinks about the captive maternal. What is it you, we want our children to live. What does it mean when we are not living or don't have the capacity to be free and have children? So right now, like I'll put the, you know, a link in the chat, but like right now there's, you know, people at the St. Louis city jail are in open rebellion, busting the windows out. Like we need, we have been here for years have not even had an opportunity to go to trial and you taking Easter, taking this like family time to literally put their lives on the line and bust the windows open. Oh, you know, we're talking about like, you'll see the image, if you haven't seen the images yet of folks saying you need to help us and saying it is our responsibility out here. What does it mean for us to be drawing our butterflies and making sure that our folks can be drawing their butterflies and none of that a priority of the University of California, right? Neither one of those. And so to me, it's like, what does it mean for us to, because right now our imaginations can be limited to that we all can survive this system. Our imagination is limited to getting, beating back the violence of this system enough that everybody makes it to be an elder. That's the deep, deep desire of mine. How much work is that? If our imagination is giving everything just to, to, to defang this system, as opposed to what would it mean for there to be no system for us to be spending all of our energy protecting us from? What if survival wasn't the goal, but the bare minimum grounds from which to dream someplace worth living, where protecting yourself, defending, where the Black Panther Party for self-defense wouldn't have had to exist because self-defense wouldn't be the primary purpose of Black life. And like, I don't even know what that would be like, but I feel like the invitation in that talk was to recalibrate our imagination, not to managing and defending against the system, but actually slicing into its heart such that there could be something like life that was not just oriented around survival. Ooh, mm, so much, so much there. Thank y'all for the butterflies and the painting and just centering that Black girlhood. And that really brings me into this next question that I have for you, Savannah, really thinking about the geographies of Black girl interiority. And I'm wondering if you can talk, you know, in Black Girl Ordinary, in your article, you speak to, quote, those of us who are Black girls, who have been Black girls, and who love Black girls. And you use this term, woman child as one word. You say we must read and write her as daughter and daughter dispossessed, un unprotected by and illegible to both categories of woman and child. 
Can you speak more to this term woman child and what it means to you in relation to black women's interiority and how black feminist geography invites us to think more deeply about the temporality of our own inner worlds. What do you believe is the relationship between black women and our black girlhoods black girls and the futurity and the presence of their black womanhood and how do our past presence and future selves reside within the geographies of our own interiors. Well, you know, this is the question you should be answering. And if y'all <laughs> have not clicked on that realiveviolette.com yet, you need to, because Re, this is your work. You have been doing, you have been creating sanctuaries and altars um, and spaces of worship for what we might think of as the Black maternal, right, in all of its temporalities for a long time. Um, and I think that work is more an answer than I'm going to give. But I'm a Scorpio, so I'm gonna answer anyway. Um, and so <laughs> I think there's a couple of things. So first of all, you would really, you really read because sometimes you should be like, well, I'll put a little sauce on this and I'm gonna move along. No, we're gonna go scrape up that sauce with a spatula and do something with it, stretch it with a little abroad. Um, and so um, I gotta think more about that. I think because y'all heard like man child in the promised land and all that, like the idea of man child is like circulates in certain parts of black culture and for those who are, I don't want to say conscripted, but I will to certain modes of heterosexuality, y'all deal with that on a day-to-day -day basis, right? Um, the production of that relation as a site of, of you know, eroticness and as a family making. And so I feel like, to me, the thing about Black girlhood, and just about people like, oh, Black girl magic, this and that. So I have like a piece around that, but thinking about like, sometimes there's an idea that we want to reject girl for woman, but to me, it's like it's it's a temporal trap because do we ever get to be children, right? So in a sense, do if if adultification and adultification impacts black people in general, right? So, which is part of why you think about why temporality doesn't hold when it approaches a body marked black, right? It also means that like age, right? We get adultified. Um, and so I'm not sure that any of us get to be girls, right? In that sense of what that all has. So that means the girl in us doesn't ever grow up, right? And so we hold that. Also, how many of us have our initial sites of trauma in those initial years, whether we were two or four or seven or 12. And so when trauma hits, it freezes you, some part of you at that age. So we're holding that eight-year-old girl, that six-year-old girl, that 14-year-old girl, sometimes all three with us, even though we're trying to act big and bad. We're trying to, you know, we're taking care of our parents. We're doing all of that. And so I think to me, it's about speaking to what it means to have a childhood arrested, but also thinking about like the flip of that is like, can we think about the way the parental like also circulates? Like, and if, even the ways we call each other in so I'm thinking about hey ma right so ma mommy but it also comes multiple gender way poppy comes in zaddy is an example of this too how we become we use the the parental is an attractant in a way that isn't just isn't 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 a kind of you know the kind of like empty play that like kind of white eroticism has over there you know what I'm saying it has something else happening in it um so I feel like there's, there's those pieces. And then in terms of, and this is, ooh, this is hot take. Um, the only way that I really know how, I feel like the way that I engage with this in an in a, in a embodied sense is my whole life is oriented around Black women and Black, Black people who have the experience of having been a woman or a girl, to use, to use Paris Hatcher's phrasing. Um, in that like, I have chosen to live a queer life. I live in the house that black lesbians built. So even if like lesbian is not a nomenclature that I use given the range of genders and like ways of being that now live in this <laughs> house, um, it is not just a kind of accident of attraction to me that I've chosen to live a life that is very specifically outside of the heterosexual parent. To me, that's about a day to a day to day, hour to hour practice of centering the value and worth and beauty and amazingness of those who have been Black women and girls. And so, for me, I'm able to honor 
the Black woman child in all of the practices of my life, right? And I know that's not something that was necessarily available to everyone or of interest to everyone, but I do think that the practice of same gender loving, both for people with the experience of having been a Black woman and girl, for the people who have the experience of having been a Black man or boy, I think same gender loving is actually a really sacred site of being able to heal that space of negation and heal that space of violence by being able to um, share a certain kind of intimacy and love with someone who reflects the same, uh, some of the same interstices of your negation, right? Thank you so much, Savannah. We have one final question from the audience and it's, um, I'm gonna um, ask Brandy if you could take this question on. Um, it's really, I think, relevant to some of uh, your work, especially since you start out your book talking about um, the presence of Obama, but also this whole legacy of like black formal representation in the chocolate city and um, yet, um, it's not always clear what that actually means for people um, and these projects and uh, uh, po processes of displacement in particular. So this question is from Kermit O. Oh, and they say, um, because Blackness varies, manifests differently in different places, how do we reconcile demands of Black nationalism, which can be culturally insular, um, the race before class kind of argument, like what, um, and the need for multiracial solidarity um, in the battle um, against patriarchy and white supremacy. I think, especially the race before class, you know, like let's be unified um, first, and then we could talk about these class distinctions. Kamala is in the White House. What, what do you say to that kind of thinking? That's a great question. Um... And you know, this is the thing. I mean, I think it relates a lot to the Joy James lecture uh, and thinking about the ways that we rely on this universal unified blackness in order to get us through and that's not what's gonna do it. Um, and, and really that's where the state um, plays this huge role that we still have this relationship to the state that we have to really fully comprehend and then break up, right? So on the one hand, the neoliberal state has become such that it, 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 distances, it distances itself from care or caring for us in the ways that it was supposed to previously. And so it relies on these privatized measures to take care or at least the market to tell us how we're supposed to live. But then folks will talk about like FDR and how that was the time that we wanna to get to, but that wasn't what was for black folks at all. Now, if we were kind of thinking about general humanity perhaps, but it certainly wasn't for black folks. The, the, it, so I think DC is a really great location to think about that question because yes, I did bring up Obama because that's when I was doing my research, you know, and thinking about this push for diversity. I'm coming from a diverse state, but the way DC was trying to do diversity was not the way, Cal that's not the way I grew up um, in terms of how to do or be diverse or what, whatever, right? There was a way that diversity was an action. And so they were just trying to add stuff, right? And so it didn't work. And then on top of that, and I think with Kamala Harris, look, I got dragged by people I know very closely because I went on TV and spoke negatively about, you know, her, um, at the time she hadn't, um, she wasn't in office, but just her, was when she was the pick, when she was um, Joe Biden's um, choice. And I was like, you know, I remember, like, I, I didn't forget. Why, why are people acting like we forgot her threatening and putting black mothers in prison? Like, I don't, I didn't forget. And so part of it was they were asking me like, well, as a black person, as a black woman, aren't you excited about, I was like, absolutely not, I'm not. And I can't pretend like I am because that would fully violate my work. Like that would completely go against everything I experienced if I supported her just because she was black when she was throwing people like me in jail, right? So I, I, I think the, the race before class thing, it's a, it's a straw man, it, just do, it doesn't work. Like it never has worked. And what it means to me for those people who are claiming it, they don't read. And I don't mean that just in terms of a, an elitist kind of way of thinking about it. You don't have to be an intellectual in order to read. And whether it's reading the community, reading the room, just read, like they're not reading. And to recognize the ways that we can't 
We can't split those and say, we need to focus on race right now. Or where you hear a lot in a lot of socialist circles, we need to only focus on class and the ways that they are not able to put these things together. And then we need to map gender, sexuality, like we have to mix region, we have to mix all of these things together to think about it. And so what that means is we actually have to go back to black feminists. We have to go back <laughs> and think about the ways that black feminists aren't just about black women, right? Black feminists are recognizing the ways that we literally all got to get together to figure this thing out, right? That we, they draw on so many different traditions. And we think about Kambahi, like they are pulling from everywhere. And honestly, thinking about like this black queer life and understanding literally how we are able to breathe, how we can be together and live together and get the basic necessities met that we claim that we want. And so for, for my research, I talk a lot about capital and capitalism because again, because of how seductive it is. The ways that we believe that if we become entrepreneurs or we can just run this thing or whether it's you are a leader in a church or whatever institution that you've decided you wanna attach yourself to and get some accumulate essentially as a way to save your people is a lie. And so I, I want us to, really be able to look at capital, absolutely, but also recognize seriously, it really does go back and on a basic and fundamental level that in order for us to act, to have clean water, in order for to eat, to have places to live, because we haven't even talked about, you know, the unsheltered population that's here. Like I can go on for days talking about that now and coming back, coming back home in 2019 and going along and seeing the underpasses or overpasses, seeing, you know, um, seeing uh, uh, garden sheds that are supposed to be somebody's house as we are literally entering a pandemic where we are told to go inside, right? So all, I think all of these elements, reading that room, reading what's going on in the world should tell people that we can't, we can't break those things up. They have to come together. And the last thing I'll say, so right now, you know, DC, or at least in the past few weeks, there's been a, a resurgence of discussions about DC statehood. And that's another thing where I got in trouble because I said, DC statehood will not happen until DC is not black anymore. DC cannot be seen as black and be a state. Any other time when states in the union have become such, it was because they were able to either lower the numbers or at least the representation of blackness in that state. So there's this incompetence that's associated with blackness that we can't make decisions for ourselves. We certainly can't make decisions for other people. So we have that there's this paternalistic relationship that DC has to the US government in that these folks will never let DC become a state. I don't care how many smart arguments are made. I don't care how many statistics are given. At the same time, as long as neoliberal leaders, regardless of whether they are Black women, are leading DC as well, we will never become, it will never become a state. It's just, we can talk about London Breed, we, we can talk about a number of people <laughs> where they literally are not thinking in ways to save, to think, to love, to live. Yep, Lori Lightfoot, I saw that, exactly. They are not, and I don't know what's going on in Boston right now, so I'm not going to speak on that, but we have to really have this open way of thinking about people. We have to really think about the ways that Black feminists have been saying it all along. And it's not just the listen to Black women and put it on our backs, but honestly, it's like, it's, a, it's an epistemological question. How do we see? This is how we see, then that's how we get free. And it's honestly, it feels like it's very simple, but you know, there's always reaction and, and people are all against it, so anyway. Thank you so much, Brandy. And oh, we had so many questions. I was going to ask the man about the sucker free city and your use of vernacular local uh, Black English, but we're going to have to have that for a round two later. Um, thank you both for your generosity and your just showing up and being so like kind and open with us. Um, thank you so much. Um, to Brandy and to Savannah and to my co-moderator and chief. <laughs> Re, Re, do you want to say a thank you? And then we'll hand it over to Professor Taylor. Yes, thank you all so much. This just filled my spirit in ways I did not even know I needed. So just thank you all. I'm really honored. Thank you. And I'll hand it over to Professor Taylor to close us out for this whole beautiful semester of critical conversations. 
Thank you, thank you, thank you. Black feminist geographies of emancipation. Woo! You know, this happened because I am chair of an amazing department. We are a small unit here at UC Berkeley, but we are mighty and we don't play. We are asking hard questions because we are trying to flex and stretch and figure out how to have more just futures for all of us outside of the academy. So we thank you for logging on to our six critical conversations. We've had a wonderful panelist and it is our hope that this has given you a language and a vocabulary on how to better understand the world that we live in so that we can collectively build more just futures for all of us. We also hope that this series will um, propel you to join us in fall 2021, when we will have another set of critical conversations and we will begin by highlighting and celebrating the life and legacy of our former department member, the brilliant poet, June Jordan. Thank you so much for being with us. We appreciate you. We hope that you go back and look at the previous conversations. All of them are on our homepage. Thank you again.